Hello everyone, welcome. Um, this is a quick review of a work called Triumph of the Therapeutic by Philip Reif. Um, I originally heard about this because Daniel from OG Rose mentioned it in a, um, in a conversation he had, I can't remember which conversation, but the name stood out to me. And um, so thank you for that to him um, because it was a very good read and it really kind of conjured up a lot of thoughts that, that were going through my head um, intuitively about the role of like health and psychology. And, and I often criticize the kind of therapeutic culture or the, the therapeutic state. And, they, and then these are words that have got somewhat popular over the past few years, I think, um, with, you know, various kind of therapeutic or psychiatric modalities, which are implemented into, I think, even media, but also workplace management or university management or um, um, the kind of peculiar objectives and, and, and roles and, and role of medicine, which I think is a kind of postmodern topic maybe, but which has come up again um, in the past few years because of certain events and so on. So it's, it kind of, um, it, it sparked my interest and I gave it a read and it was very good. And um, Rife is an American sociologist who I, his first book I've read by him, so I don't know a whole, whole lot about him, but he seems to write it, has, has, has at least two books about Freud. And this is one of them, or in general, the the role, the kind of, he's a sociologist, so he's doing something which I think that psychoanalysts don't, or psychologists in general, aren't the best at, which is viewing themselves sociologically and like what role do they play and towards what end are they working towards and so on and so forth. I don't think they really think about this. And this is sort of this is sort of the theme of the book to to a certain extent, but um, it's something worth worth noting. This um, the idea of like health or the idea of like uh, well being is something which I think we take for granted. It seems to be something which is like self justifying. It, it it doesn't really, and this is actually the point he makes at the end of the book. As I get to it, but it, it doesn't seem to be like the byproduct of anything or as a part of any greater ideal it seems to just be like a given something in and of in and of itself um okay so um so in the book he he distinguishes basically freud from the kind of post freudians and the post freudians were the people who wrote after freud um many of which freud actually denounced um like jung and wilhelm reich and he also talks a bit about lawrence um i think it's dh lawrence is the first initials um you'd have to check that but i think it's uh, someone i never come across before so um but these post freudians were um different from freud in 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 and, and interestingly the, the history of psychoanalysis is a history of a lot of conflict um the freudians and the post freudians uh were kind of in i i think freud in one text pretty much denounced like most of his followers um which is interesting and i think the distinction the distinction which reif is making is um, you basically have the classical view of therapeutics, you have the Freudian, and you have the post-Freudian. And the classical view of therapeutics was what he would call a therapeutic of commitment. This was a kind of transformational process. Of course, religion played this role ultimately. So this, this book is also about the looking at psychoanalysis as a, or therapeutic, psychotherapeutics in general, we could say, um, as a response to the loss of religion and the role of religion played. Um, the Freudian, rather than being a therapy of commitment, the Freudian intervention was a therapy, or not intervention, the th Freudian response, we could say, was a um, therapy of detachment. And it was, instead of transformational, he says it was informative. Um, the idea of a superego versus the individual is very much at, very much the kind of essence of a lot of what he's talking about. The superego, we don't have to have like a super crazy nuanced, um, view of it or anything here for the sake, for the purposes of this book, you could say it's just, it's, it's what comes about through the moral and, uh, moral demands and, and constraints that a society's put onto the individual. Um, and interestingly, Freud 
um, he, he distinguished him, himself here from Wilhelm Reich, who we'll get into a bit in a minute. But um, Freud is interesting because he didn't think we could like liberate ourselves from repression in like this totalizing way. He didn't think like history would overcome this. He didn't think like some sort of technology would overcome this. Um, if you read, um, what is it called? Uh, Civilization and its discontents, you'll see that Freud basically argues that some level of repression is necessary necessary by the very existence of a society, um, of collective living. So what's the point of Freudian psychotherapy then? Well, I, Rife would say, I think something like that it's, 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 it gives the individual a better, um, a better uh, negotiating power against the superego by informing yourself and becoming aware of the dynamics in which you have with the superego, which cause you uh, psychological conflict and stress and so on. You can, you know, you can't free yourself from it totally, but you can basically negotiate with it in, in, in a sense. Um, your past won't completely determine your future, we could also say. Your experiences aren't just these totalizing forces. There's a kind of awareness which you can, can go along, um, which gives you more freedom um, to respond. But at the same time, this freedom kind of comes with a sacrifice, and the sacrifice is detachment. There's, I suppose, there's a kind of risk of it becoming its own form of replacement religion for the post-religious era if that makes sense it's very different from traditional religion but it kind of operates and in, in, it, it performs the same therapeutic function um the therapies of commitment the classical therapies of commitment are basically therapies where uh, kind of fully con and, and fully committing yourself to a a uh, participating in a in a in a collective um, ideal is the way to overcome this mental conflict and this suffering. Um, this yourself fully um, obviously isn't just a abstract ideal. It's something that has to be kind of embodied in a culture to a certain extent. And it's the loss of this basically that has led to the need for something like the mo the modern psychological therapeutic treatment of people um the loss of there being anything really available to give yourself to um and it doesn't necessarily have to be your society it could be a, a new society it could be a kind of a split between you and your society and, and then it could be a something new which then emerges um which you can give yourself to and so on this would be the more classical sense so Freud, so the, the antagonism that he, he argues that Freud has with uh, or had with post-Freudians like Jung and Reich was that they kind of rejected this therapy of detachment and they kind of they kind of rejected this therapy of um, purely kind of rational informing. Um, Jung, for example, obviously he goes back into like what is more archaic and archetypal and mythological. Um, there's a there's a rejection of the of the intellect and and of the of of the supremacy of the rational for something more more ancient. And um, the problem he, he he somewhat polemically, even though he he understands why why these writers were writing what they were writing, he somewhat polemically. Um, you know, criticizes Jung in the sense that Jung basically acted as a what he called like a curator of a museum, where because there was no collective uh, culture to commit yourself to, as a kind of therapeutic response, um, we were forced to Jung kind of came emerged as an option of like of of, of creating your own individual and personal mythological and. Um, archetypal um uh, meaning right there was no communal anymore so you could kind of personally delve back into these historical archetypes and myths and kind of pick what suits you and what works for you and what reflects your truth and so on and so forth and i think um uh kind of somewhat dismissively says that young was a, a a curator like a museum curator who was kind of picking and choosing your 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 um, best 
uh, archetypal option which reflected your your situation um the best and i think that he's not saying that this, this doesn't work or this makes people worse or anything. he's not saying he's not criticizing this as a therapeutic response he's just saying from a sociological perspective um that this uh lack of a communal ideal how how much can we rely on like merely personal uh myths and archetypes does this really does this not kind of does this really work is basically trying to say if we don't have a communal um uh archetypal process and we'll get to the we'll get to the um the questions we can say that 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 this merely personal response brings up after i just want to talk about reich first because his 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 um his his criticisms of Reich are actually even more relevant, I think, than Jung. Reich, for those who don't know, Wilhelm Reich um, was a kind of Freudian disciple, but he he invented what you might know as kind of Freudo Marxism. It's basically the mixture of like Freud and Marx together, um, and uh, his his general belief he adopted from the communists wasn't that communism would bring us to the end of um history and the uh, kind of a kind of teleological historical liberation from you know the re- the restraints of capitalism and so on from a from the view of political economy but rather reich turned it into libido that kind of libido libidinal economy was the way we would all liberate ourselves. So he 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 basically adopted this ideal of a historical ideal, um, and remember, ideal is something that Freud doesn't have. Um, so he's so he's replacing he he's he's putting in his own ideal um, here, which is which is the total and, and and as opposed to Freud, who believed that repression was just was was you know here to stay, and it was it was just um, a part of living in a civilization. Um, Reich rather thought that we could overcome, we could totally overcome any libidinal repression whatsoever. Um, which, of course, was the very informative of the um, you know, sexual revolution and so on and so forth, and attacking basically any sort of whether it's paternal authority, religious authority. Any authority, any restraint on libidinal expression itself was um, was was completely was completely dismissed, and that was the ideal. And I think we can probably have a look around today and say that that is basically been a failure. So these these were these. I think I think I think Reif would probably say that these were were justified responses to the lack of communal purpose. Which Freud brought forth, but it, it, but they were in themselves failed. Like one just wanted to like liberate ourselves from any sort of any sort of constraints altogether, and the other was more conservative. Jung was much more conservative, but he couldn't see anything communal in it. He could only see something personal, and then this kind of comes into this quite you know somewhat comical uh, museum analogy of you just kind of go into this kind of museum of curated, um, archetypes and myths, and you don't really have any intimate connection to any of this. It's merely personal. Um, and the, the kind of larger questions that this brings up is the general direction. I think this is very relevant to, um, uh, what is emerging today, which is a sort of, uh, I think the postmodernists somewhat were onto this, like Foucault especially, um, and I think this is uh, this is emerging today. I think within a less a, a less kind of left and progressive way, it's 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 a bit more ambiguous today. But there's an awareness of of a um, what is health for. I think I don't sure if I mentioned this at the start of this, of this conversation, but we take for granted what health is for. We just say health, that's good. But we don't say, yeah, but what is it for? And the point of Rife is basically to say that the classical sense was health and psychological well-being and overcoming mental conflict was a byproduct of some sort of communal higher purpose. Where with the, with the modern view of, of um, therapeutics, it's just a mean... It, it, it's a good in and of itself. Like health is just, it, 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 it doesn't have to justify itself against some sort of other 
as being a byproduct or a consequence of some other higher ideal. Like, so with this, you have the risk of a kind of breakup between uh, meaning or morality or purpose, especially collective purpose, and happiness and health. We're kind of just happiness because that's the way it is, and we don't really have it as a byproduct of anything. Um, there's other kind of sociological ideas which he, which he, which are very useful that he proposes, and he says that. Um, Cultural elites, um, he thinks that psychotherapists are basically examples of a cultural elite, uh, cultural elite which are similar to religious cultural elite, which would be priests. So he distinguishes between social and political, sorry, political, um, political elites and cultural elites elites and the job of the cultural elites is to basically work within the realm of what he calls release and control um mechanisms of release and control and this is the kind of super egotistical role it is to impose um ex moral demands and expectations upon the society at large um but it's also to uh impose um, we could say kind of like uh, outlets of release. You can release. Um, so, for example, psychotherapeutics is very much more in the release category. It's there so that you can like say something you're not supposed to say to anyone else or you can release energy you're not supposed to release anywhere else and so on and so forth. Um, and he doesn't think that he, he doesn't think that a cultural elite was once purely control and then it became released progressively he thinks that it, it goes through different cycles and phases and i i really agree with this i think that he, he thinks that I, this is this is a mis this is a misdemeanor i think that we have today both progressives and conservatives that history was much more restrictive and it gradually got much more uh liberational and i think that actually it probably goes through more so I mean, he thinks he thinks that basically stages of um let's say symbolic standards and symbolic meanings um go through different phases um where certain cultural elites are in charge and then they start to lose their power and then something else comes about um so this is a kind of so a a a, a kind of a solid stable cultural elite will impose a set of control mechanisms upon the general so society once though that, that those symbols and, and 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 moral demands become let's say i don't know um dysfunctional or become uh, meaningless and so on there's a kind of stage of release from from these but at the end of that release there would traditionally be a new set of controls which are put in right what he's warning of is that with the invention of uh, modern psychotherapy as a kind of cultural as as a kind of fill-in cultural elite um that 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 it makes it impossible for for a new set of controls to be put in for a new set of meanings and symbols and moral demands to be put in by a cultural elite because the cultural elite are are are, are acting in a way which is sort of like reassuring themselves against the very duty of having to once they've released from one set of symbolic demands and controls, create a new set of symbolic demands and controls. Um, I have a quote here, which is, yeah, this is basically what you think. This is a quote from him. The modern cultural revolution has built into it itself a unique prophylaxis. It is deliberately not in the name of any new order of communal purpose that is taking place. On the contrary, this revolution is being fought for a permanent disestablishment of any deeply internalized moral demands in a world which can guarantee a plentitude produced without reference to the rigid maintenance of any particular interdictory or counter interdictory system. Interdictory just means, that's an end quote, but interdictory just basically means um, restraint or control or in, uh, inhibition. Um, another quote, which is good. Quote, it is anti-political, a revolution of the rich by which they have lowered their, excuse me, which they have lowered the pressure 
on themselves of inherited communal purpose, end quote. So uh, this reminded me a little bit of, um, I haven't actually read it, but I know the general premise of the book is Christopher Lash's Revolt of the Elites. And it is basically that he's noticing, and I should say, by the way, that Rife wrote this in, I think it was the 60s. I think it was, I think it was 66, but I don't know if it's the exact date, but it was sometime in the 60s. And Lash was running in the 80s. So you could nearly see Rife as a, um, really onto something at a very early stage. Um, where you have an elite, where a cultural elite, which doesn't kind of liberate from a, a, an old set of failing symbols and, 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 and impositions and restraints and then create a new set, they sort of indefinitely just abdicate the duty of having to create a new set of restraints and controls. Um, uh, this has a lot to do, I think, with, as he says, it was a revolution of the rich. We don't have a sort of um, in any way ascetic or any way um, committed um, moral ideal or civilizational ideal and purpose to obtain. And therefore, we don't have a kind of elite who are going to embody and, 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 and lead us to there because they don't they don't want the pressure of that. They don't want the responsibility of that. They want to indefinitely liberate themselves from that. So. There's a kind of, in, and, and this reminds me of like the the um, end of history. It's like the end of history seems to constantly happen. I think this is, this is something Zizek has pointed out. We kind of have this indefinite era of crisis, um, this constant failure, which doesn't lead anywhere. Like no new system takes over. We just like have this indefinite crisis. Um, so I think that that's an extremely prescient point that he was making all the way back in the 60s. And, and, and there's something about it. And it basically leads, I think, to this um, this therapeutic modality, which is um, indefinite detachment, and, in, and 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 we could say the kind of indefinite at atomization that it isn't really able to respond to. It, let's say let's, let's say this: it's able to relieve. This is the kind of Freudian perspective I'm talking about now. It's able to relieve um, the, in the, the particular and individual sufferings to some extent or another, sometimes better than other times, but to some extent of individual suffering, which the kind of failing society causes. But it's not able to actually help create anything new. And this is sort of what Jung and Reich were trying to do, and they completely failed at it, but this is kind of what they were trying to do. So there's this question of like, what is the role then of health and of psychology and of, of therapeutics in the long run if it's merely responding to particular uh, miseries and conflicts, but it can't really propose anything new which will address the, the overall lack of this kind of communal loss. Um, and what would happen from that is, I think, is, uh, this is something I'm inserting, this is not necessarily right saying this, but would be a kind of indefinite hyper-atomization of everything, right? Because you have this relationship to the superego where you're rejecting it. You're like, this is stupid. Don't, don't impose these demands on me. It's making me suffering. It's not fair. And then you create distance from the superego. You, you create distance from the collective. But you can't form a new collective to overcome this. So there's this kind of indefinite, just individualization and atomization of everyone. And I think that that's exactly where we're at today. 